All right, let's continue our look at electrons and it's really interesting to see what goes on. Now so far we've learnt quite a bit but today we're going to concentrate on electrons moving because they can and sometimes they leave or enter an atom and then the atom becomes a special term which we call an ion. Oops, very light printing. Now an ion is a charged atom. We know that atoms do not have any charge. They have equal numbers of protons and electrons. And this means equal numbers of positives and negatives. And so there is no net charge on there. But an ion has either more or less electrons than it does protons. Now let's see how that can possibly happen. Right, back to this. I'm going through this again. Electrons, they're mo still moving around nucleus. They're still moving randomly. They're still unique and different. And they still have different amounts of energy. Remember, this level here, this cloud here, has less energy, the electrons have less energy than the electrons who live in this cloud. And it keeps going up. The amount of energy increases as we move out. Now I'm going to rush through this a little bit. Maybe you need to visit, revisit some of the other things if not. Now let's go a bit of physics because a fellow by the name of Coulomb spent a lot of time giving us some basic ideas of what goes on in terms of charge. And we know there's a charge of positive and there's a charge of negative. They're the basic charges. If I put a positive and negative together, they want to attract or pull each other together. So this force would be a force of attraction. Over here, when we put the same charges, they tend to push apart or repel each other. And the basic law is that like charges, repel, so if they're the same charge, they push apart and repel, so two positives, two negatives, push apart, right, and then opposite charges attract. And they want to come together. Now this is quite important because we've got two charged particles in our atom. Actually there are more, but for our purposes we're concentrating on the two. And I'll put them below. I've used the same colour coordination. So my positive in my atom is the proton. My negative in my atom is the electron. I don't care about my neutral parts. They're not charged. I'm interested in charges. So if we've got a proton and an electron, they tend to try to attract each other. Now the reason electrons are still existing and don't just sort of spiral into the nucleus and and smash and join up with the proton is they're moving and they're moving randomly. That's essentially why they don't fall in. But if I've got two protons together, they will try to push each other apart. If I've got two electrons too close to each other, they will push each other apart. Now this becomes really important when we talk about or when you talk about the shape of molecules because there is a special thing there, and your senior chemistry teacher will tell you all about it, which is called the valence shell electron repulsion theory. Which means these push apart, and that decides the shape of my molecule. So, to recap, if I've got a proton and electron, they will try to attract each other. If I've got a, two protons, they will try to repel. If I've got two electrons too close to each other, they try to repel. So what's that got to do with the atom? Well, lots, as it turns out. Coulomb also studied how big the force was. So the force between a, a proton and electron of attraction varies depending upon how close they are together. And he noticed that 
and I'm not going to put the whole equation up. If you do senior physics, you'll notice this one. So the force is proportional to the inverse of the distance of apart they are squared. Now that's important. What that means is that if I've got my particles this far apart, right? Let's say that is a, just a force and we say give a force a number. So it's a force of, and I'm just making these numbers up but it's not correct. So let's say it's 10 newtons, force of attraction between them. Now this is way, way wrong, but I'm just putting numbers in to show you the balance of this. Right, now I've equaled the, I've doubled the distance now between this proton and this electron. So the outermost electron. So that would mean the force actually becomes one quarter or 2.5 newtons if I use that numbers. Now, these numbers I've used are made up numbers. They are wrong. I'm just trying to show you the relationship. So the force, even though I've only doubled the distance, the force becomes one quarter as strong. So this means it's easier for me to try to do something with this electron out here because the force of attraction between these two is getting smaller. If I tripled this distance, if I put another one out here somewhere, and which was three times the distance, there's distance, there's two distances. So if I had three distances out here somewhere, my force would be one ninth the value, or 1.1 newtons. So it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as I spread the atoms out. Now we know that happens because this could be in real terms, in the atom terms, now let's relate it back to the atoms. In the atom terms, this could be the K shell. This could be the L shell. All right, so the force of attraction between the nucleus and the electrons in the K shell is going to be much stronger than the L shell because the L shell is further away from the nucleus. Oh goodness, why didn't I think of that? So the L shell, goodness, I'm in trouble, is further away from the nucleus, so it's going to have a smaller force. All right. I think that's pretty self evident from what we've done. And a few things to go. Right, so, but there's other things that come into play. Now, remember we said. The important thing is, like charges repel each other. So what we're going to see is we are going to actually see that we have a series of electrons. Let's say if I've got electrons in here, here, and here. All right. Now the only way I'm going to get that is if I've got, I've got to fill the shells up first, but more about that later. All right, so for this, for this electron to be in this shell, all of these spaces must be used. All of these spaces must be used. So let's look at what would be happening in terms of the force of the nucleus, or the attraction force from the nucleus on them. Right, the attraction force on the first or the K shell is going to be quite strong because there's nothing to stop it. All right? Now, on this electron, though, there is going to be an attraction here, but it's going to be weaker because the distance is bigger. But there's also between it these other negative charges that are going to push this electron away. So it's going to be attracted to the nucleus, but pushed away by this inner shell. Hmm, so the force gets even weaker, right? The force is pretty weak without worrying about this shielding, if you like. In other words, they're stopping the force from having an effect. The shield will stop something. So shielding means we're going to stop the force having an effect on the electrons between the nucleus, the positive nucleus, and the electrons. So there... 
no shielding, so it's just straight attraction between these two. Here I've got attraction, but I've also got shielding and, and repulsion. Here, on this third one, it's further complicated. I've got attraction, but a lot smaller because I'm further away. In this thing, this electrons in this cloud is pushing me away. This electron in this cloud is pushing me away. So my forces get less and less and less. So the further I move away from the nucleus, the less force of attraction there is. And that means it's easier to take that electron and remove it to form the ion. Now in science we give it a special name and we call it ionisation energy. You could almost think of it about being an equation. Here's the equation for an ionisation energy. It's to form a charge, just taking one electron. So right, we're going to take one electron from this atom to do it. Now the real definition should tell me because over here we've talked about units of kilojoules per mole. Now a mole is just an amount and you'll find out more about that later. A mole is an amount of substance. So if I've got one mole of this then I'm going to make one mole of this because the numbers one and one are the same and I'm going to make one mole of electrons. So when we're comparing them we use the units of kilojoules which is an energy term per mole, which is an amount term, or quantity term. So, for example, if I'm doing this one, I've got magnesium, I'm going to do this and this. It is not as big as if I had, it's got two electrons in two shells, so we have some of that shielding stuff going on. So it's not going to be as high as, let's say, if I had only one shell. And now the corresponding one of that would be beryllium, but I'm not going to put it in there. All right, so if we take away the number of shells, it's going to be bigger. So this is basically a figure of how much energy I need to do to do this. And that's all to do with the amount of energy attraction and repulsion I'm getting going on in the atom and that's due to this shielding effect as we get it. Magnesium has some shielding effects so it's a bit less than what we'd normally think it would be without the shielding. Interesting point. Metal atoms like magnesium always, always have a lower have a lower amount of ionisation energy than, let's say, a non-metal atom. So, in the same, with the same number of, and I'm not, not going to do this totally, this value, and I'm not going to give them to you because they're available in data booklets anywhere we can see them. Right, this value is going to be less than this value. In other words, this has a greater hold on its electrons than this one. We could say that the ionisation energy gives me some idea of how tightly an atom holds its electrons. And on that note, I'm going to finish it there.